Today, we're going to talk about the medical model of disability. If you haven't yet, I'd recommend that you watch the introduction to this series, which sets up some of the questions that we're trying to answer. It also makes some caveats that I'll repeat here briefly because of today's topic. I'm going to present each of these models with an attitude of charity, in the best faith possible. That is to say, as if I really truly believe that this model is the best one. That doesn't mean that I endorse the model, necessarily, and it's especially important to note that disability communities writ large predominantly reject the medical model. It has been a source of pain for many disabled individuals throughout history and in the present, and I want to acknowledge that. But we're going to engage it fully for the sake of understanding the argument, even if it's to reject it, though as Justice Kuhn points out in his 2022 article, it remains the default model for a lot of medical practitioners and people in general. In his article, Kuhn defines disability as an enduring biological dysfunction that causes its bearer a significant degree of impairment. The most important part of this definition, Kuhn argues, is that it makes disability a genuine kind, rather than an arbitrary or gerrymandered collection of properties, and it grounds our normative duties to people with disabilities. Let's break this down. We can see the influence of Bors and Wakefield and the biostatistical theory in this modern definition. Biological offers a value-free indicator, value-free meaning descriptive and devoid of normative content that tells us how the world should be. If disability is going to be the purview of medicine and its ends, this definition implicitly tells us, medicine should attend to the biological elements of disability. And where do we see that biology? In dysfunction. Dysfunction harkens back to Bors's definition of disease as part function. This functionalist, teleological approach sees organs and systems and limbs and so on as having an aim. The lungs draw in oxygen, the heart circulates blood to oxygenate it, and so on. A biological dysfunction describes an empirical deviation from the body element's purpose. As maligned as functionalism has been, Kuhn gives it a solid Darwinian spin. An organ has phi-ing as a function if and only if that organ persists in a population, at least partly because phi-ing was favored in recent rounds of selection. In other words, this isn't arbitrary or mere Aristotelianism or a medieval model that says hearts beat because they love God. True to form, this is a biological explanation of function. If legs were selected to move how they do, with articulation as humans often have and with the strength humans often have, and so on, that means while there is not a normative good behind legs working that way, there is a value-free evolutionary prudentialism to legs functioning in that way. But, I injured my knee in martial arts last week, and I'm having trouble walking. Does that constitute disability? To account for the difference between injury and disability, the medical model looks at two quantitative elements, time and significance. A biological dysfunction has to be enduring, that is, it has to persist over a long period. This accounts for injury. Sure, I might have some trouble walking for a week. Maybe I even need surgery and it takes six months or a year for me to move like I did before. But eventually, injury heals while disability does not. Now this doesn't have to be permanent for it to count. Kuhn suggests the example of a person who's blind for 30 years, but who has a surgical procedure so he can see. He was disabled before the surgery, but is not afterward. Wait, you might say, we're running into a sorites paradox here. Imagine you have a grain of sand. Now, add another. Congratulations, you have two grains of sand. Add another. Now you have three. Keep going. At what point would we call this a heap of sand? You can run it backwards, too. Let's imagine we have a heap of sand. Take one grain away. At what point does it cease to be a heap? No problem, Kuhn says. We have all kinds of vague definitions. He admits that if we put a number on it, this is going to seem very arbitrary. If my injury lasts for a year, it's an injury, but if it lasts for a year and a day, it's a disability? Better, he argues, to keep it a little vague. A similar argument can be made about severity, though here again we can look to Borson and Wakefield's model for some ostensibly value-free reassurance. Remember that the BST takes the average of function as its indicator of health. So when we say significant impairment, we could literally chart it out by statistical function. While it's okay to have some vagueness here as well, because we're going to hit the same paradox, we can at least rely on the value-free measurement of the average to keep us from making normative claims about disability. And it's that reliance on value-free indicators, Kuhn argues, that keeps the medical model's definition from being an arbitrary or gerrymandered collection of properties. It relies on biological indicators and evolution and statistics to make descriptive rather than normative claims. The real payoff, pun intended, for Kuhn is that this value-free basis explains our normative claims. 
why we invest resources in treating and accommodating disability. We have a moral duty to help those who face compromised health, and, by definition, disability is an enduring state of compromised health. This is not mere public policy or economics. It has to do with our promise-keeping duties and our duties to society. Our definition of disability must be based on these value-free indicators so that we know more or less scientifically that these people are in a state of compromised health so that we can fulfill our moral duties to them. This is the human face of the medical model, as Kuhn calls it. Now, Kuhn ends his desiderata section by equivocating on whether or not the medical model defines if people with disabilities have a reduced quality of life or potential for flourishing or happiness. But, as I said at the beginning of this video, and as Hare would argue, claims about health are always normative. If disability is biological dysfunction, it requires fixing. We may even have a moral duty to fix it. And if disabilities are biologically or psychologically inextricable from the person who has them, as both may seem logically to be the case and as many people in the disability community argue, that seems to imply that disabled people need fixing. Obviously, disabled people have important objections to that, and we'll take up the first of those in our next video.